Welcome to episode 177 of Angela Watson's Truth for Teachers. I'm your host, Angela Watson, and I'm here to speak life, encouragement, and truth into the minds and hearts of educators and get you energized for the week ahead. Today, I'm speaking with the author of Rage Becomes Her about how we can support our students and ourselves in expressing our full range of emotions. Visit truthforteachers.com to get the transcript or find our new Truth For Teachers podcast community on Facebook. You can share your thoughts on the show there and reflect with other listeners in our private group. This episode is sponsored by UL Explore Labs. It's a free STEM-focused experience to build scientific knowledge and passion among middle school students. UL Explore Labs makes it simple to implement hands-on investigations in the classroom and is aligned with NGSS. Get your students solving real-world problems by going to ulxplorlabs.org. My guest today is a woman whose book literally changed my life and changed my marriage. Soraya Chamali is an activist, an award-winning writer, and a media critic. And her recent book, Rage Becomes Her, The Power of Women's Anger, was named a best book of 2018 by Fast Company, Psychology Today, Book Riot, and The Washington Post. For me personally, it's been one of the most influential books I've ever read. I got three chapters in and I said to my husband, you have got to read this. This book is a summary of what it's like to be a woman in America. This is everything. If you read this, you will understand me a thousand times better because Soraya is saying everything that I've been thinking and feeling but couldn't articulate. So my husband started listening to the audiobook and he called me about a half an hour into it and he said, I get it now. I get it now. This lady is amazing. And he starts piecing together all the same revelations that I was having as I was reading. And we have since spent hours dissecting the themes of this book together. I think we both have a much deeper understanding of how we have been conditioned to express our emotions, him as a man and me as a woman. And that insight has really transformed the way that we communicate and we relate to one another now. Soraya has this fascinating way of illuminating patterns and connecting the dots between all the little things that you know aren't quite right and that don't quite make sense to you, but she somehow just ties them together in a way that makes it easy to see the big picture. So I want to begin, before we dive into the interview, I want to read you an excerpt from her book, which I think sums up the premise really well, and it lays the groundwork for the questions that I'm going to ask Soraya, because warning, (laughs) they are deep. This is what she writes in the book, Rage Becomes Her. Men more frequently associate feeling powerful with experiencing anger, but women notably associate powerlessness with anger. It's as children that most of us learn to regard anger as unfeminine, unattractive, and selfish. Many of us as girls are taught that our anger will be an imposition on others, making us irksome and unlikable, that it will alienate our loved ones or put off people that we want to attract, that it will twist our faces, make us ugly. This is true even for those of us who have to use anger to defend ourselves in charged and dangerous situations. As girls, we are not taught to acknowledge or manage our anger so much as to fear and ignore and hide and transform it. On the other hand, anger and masculinity are powerfully enmeshed and reinforce one another. In boys and men, anger has to be controlled, but it's often seen as a virtue, especially when it's used to protect or defend or lead. Anger is thought of in terms of disruption, loudness, authority, vulgarity, physical aggression, domination, and it's couched in terms of violence and cliches of masculinity. Boys learn early on about anger, but far less about other feelings, which handicaps them and society in different ways. Socially discouraged from seeming feminine, in other words, being empathetic or vulnerable or compassionate, their emotional alternatives often come down to withdrawal, or aggressive expressions of anger. This book is an interrogation of questions that demand our attention, such as, what would it mean to ungender our emotions? 
What would the world look like if all of us were allowed to experience and productively express the full range of emotions without penalty? So that's the end of the quote, but it's just the beginning of our time exploring this topic. What would the world look like if all of us were allowed to experience and productively express the full range of our emotions without penalty? So Soraya is going to talk about that so that we can do better by our students and we can disrupt these patterns in the classroom. And along the way, we'll also explore how these things that she's teaching us can improve our own lives and our relationships, our friendships, our partnerships, our marriages, because every person is impacted by and restricted by these norms. So listen in. So Soraya, I want to start off with one of the most important terms that I learned from the book, which is benevolent sexism. And I think that the word benevolent makes a really important distinction because a lot of people think that sexism only means like hating women or consciously believing that men are superior to women. But benevolent sexism is something that's, I think, maybe more prevalent and and something that all of us have internalized to some extent and therefore we need to examine. So I'm wondering if you can tell us more about that term. Sure. Uh, so benevolent sexism, also it's sometimes referred to as ambivalent sexism, is not hostile. It's not, as you described, a hatred of women. As a matter of fact, it's often the opposite. It seems very caring, very paternalistic, very protective. That doesn't mean, however, that it doesn't reflect prejudices. And that distinction between a hostile sexism and a warmer, fuzzier sexism is important because very often the insidious quality of sexism comes out of this idea that this is good for you, that the person who is enacting this sexism is caring for you. And that makes it very difficult, right? Because you don't You don't look at someone who's smiling and opening a door for you or talking about how they would like to provide materially for you and think, oh, this is a problem for me. This is uh, limiting my my ability to live a, a free and equal life. So if, for example, somebody says, oh, women are just they're just better parents. They're, you know, they just have a caring instinct and men just can't, you know, they're just they're just not very good at it. Or if someone excessively compliments a man for simply doing the task of taking care of his child, right? The the foundation of that is that he cannot, quote unquote, naturally and normally do that. It must be that he's an exceptional man. Um, And so that's one good example. All of the gender essentialist ideas about feelings. Women are kinder. They're more compassionate. um, They... They put others first, they're more communal, all of those types of things. The flip side of that, of course, is that men are stronger and that they're warriors and that they're supposed to physically protect us and that they're bigger and that all of those kinds of generalized attributes then become institutionalized in things like who we think of as an ideal worker and how we think about protection. You know, men know that a big part of masculinity is this idea that they need to provide and protect. But in fact, women are providing and protecting all the time. You know, we protect our families, for example, from food toxicity, but nobody ever thinks about that as a form of protection because the word protection itself is so masculinized. That's a really, really great example. Um, I really like another one also that you give in your book, Rage Becomes Her. You talk about how benevolent sexism can show up in classrooms. And you talk about how teachers, um, you know, research has shown that they ask boys more open-ended questions. And that, quote, when boys speak out of order in class, which they do at eight times the rate that girls do, yes, they are not reprimanded as frequently or told to raise their hands and wait their turns. And you also mentioned that, quote, girls higher grades in school are tied to their being good, meaning quiet, as they are to mastery of subject matter. And this compliance put girls and women at a disadvantage as they move into college and the workplace, where disruptive speech is an element of competence and self-promotion and competitiveness. So I'm wondering if you can talk to us about what teachers need to understand to disrupt these patterns. So, you know, it's interesting. It's now been about 30 years of research about classroom dynamics. And over the course of those 30 years, 
the research has changed, the studies have changed, um, but one, th these biases are really stubborn and consistent. And so we know from studies in linguistics, studies, uh, educational studies like those of classroom uh, dynamics, um, sociology, like it's coming from many different disciplines that linguistics really matter and that disruptive speech. So for example, telling jokes or using curse words or being loud, all of that speech very early on is coded as masculine. It's coded as a more male behavior. And so girls who are loud or disruptive or funny are often excessively disciplined and, and reprimanded for that behavior because not only is it disruptive, but it's also gender transgressive. And then when you add the element of race to that, it becomes much more complicated yet again. So we know, for example, that starting in kindergarten in the United States, young black girls are disciplined, suspended, and expelled at excessively high rates compared to young white girls and even to boys. And they're often held um, accountable for acting in ways that in young boys is seen as rambunctiousness or uh, potential leadership. And so that's how the bias really plays out. And what you end up with is that in part of the idea that boys are not doing their schoolwork well or don't have preschool preparedness or that girls are just better students is that we are rewarding girls for conformity and for um, doing what they're told as opposed to for mastering a subject matter. Is there something specific or actionable that you can think of that teachers can do to correct this? Maybe a behavior that they you know, can look out for in themselves or something they could do to, um, to sort of disrupt these patterns that would be a good first step? So I think that it's a whole community effort. Teachers mm -hmm. are really not aware. They're humans. We're all human beings. We all have these biases. And in fact, a lot of research suggests that being aware of a bias not only may not help, but might, might in fact cognitively cause people to double down on the bias because people don't like the association of guilt or shame or the idea that maybe they're doing this. And that causes a kind of cognitive blindness or stubbornness. But one of the things that I always recommend is that an assessment be done by schools. Like what's really happening? Can we do some classroom observations? Can we film what's happening? Because what is often the case is a teacher will say, oh no, that's me, I don't have that at all. I, I'm very aware of this. But if you show them a video of their interactions with the classroom, it's very clear, for example, that they're making more eye contact with boys, that they're rewarding girls for holding their hands up, but they are allowing boys to just not do that and to answer anyway. It's very subtle. It's very granular. It's um, quite pervasive. So one would be this idea that you need a climate survey or an assessment survey so that you can, frankly, convince a lot of people that, it, that it's happening and that, that it's meaningful. Mm. I want to share another quote from the book here. Um, you wrote, as children, we learn that the realm of feelings is feminine. So it is easy for men and boys to fall into a habit of outsourcing relationships, social networking, and the emotional work that comes with them. Women will spend time and effort sending holiday cards and gifts to family members, arranging teachers' presents and coaches' retirement parties. We are often busy not only managing our own feelings, but also regulating the feelings of others. And I'm wondering if you can talk about this emotional labor a little bit and how this shows up, not only with students in the classroom, but in teachers' personal lives too. Wow. Um, well, yes. I mean, I, I think now we have decades of academic study about this quality of emotional labor, which technically began, uh, it was coined by Arlie Hochschild and maybe 27 years ago, when she was describing the work that people do, overwhelmingly women in service industries, for example, the emotional work of suppressing their own feelings in order to set other people at ease. And she used the example at the time of maybe flight attendants um, or nurses. And um, teachers 
also have a high quotient of emotional labor that they do. And in fact, the stress of the labor that teachers do, which includes this kind of labor, which is be kind, be nice, be patient, you know, put aside your negative feelings, put aside your exhaustion, make sure that you're focused on others, all of that care work and nurturing work, it, it's stressful and it's exhausting. And so teachers have ex extremely high burnout rates all over the world. And yet we don't talk about what the demand that, that they maintain this affect has, it doesn't, you know, we don't talk about those impacts. So in their in their personal lives, which I, I struggle because I really think that making a distinction between personal and professional life hurts us ultimately, because it's not like you can flip a switch and say, now I'm my personal self and now I'm my professional self. You know, if you're suffering from immense stress and um, the regulation of your emotions at work, you're much more likely to go home where you, you can relax a little bit and... Um, have strong negative emotions that finally have a release. So the expression that I write about in the book is called punching down and punching down is that you take that frustration that you have and you get angry at someone who is less powerful than you. And that might be your child, for example, right? You, you go home and you, you lose it with, with your spouse or your kids in a way that you can't at, at school or in your job. Um, and so those those are really all tangled up together, you know. I have another really powerful quote from your book that I want to share here. When women are asked why they are tired and frustrated, they don't say discrimination and bias are wearing me out today. They usually say it's because they're always working or take it for granted, never have enough time and can't make ends meet financially, all of which have direct links to discrimination and bias. The jobs that women tend to do are intensely emotionally demanding and require suppressing negative emotions such as anger. Women are aggregated in sectors where being cheerful, accommodating, flexible, and patient, no matter the circumstance, are job requirements. These are idealized maternal qualities that, when fulfilled on demand, require constant suppression of negative emotions and trigger high stress. Can you elaborate on this quote? Uh, one thing that I have found generally, I think, healthy and useful is the ability to have people around you that you trust or that you rely on as a community with whom you can express those feelings freely. It may be other teachers. It might be a circle of friends outside of a school. But part of the issue is that there's a lot of conflict in saying these kids really tick me off, right? Like you're supposed to care for these kids and teach them and nurture them and grow them into kind human beings and curious people. But that is really hard. And saying that this causes me stress or this makes me angry can also be hard. And I think it's interesting because professions like teaching and nursing are proto-maternal professions, right? They, they literally are female dominated, uh, largely because they have been traditionally and continue to be seen as extensions of mothering, responsibility for, for children and responsibility for the, the health and well-being of other people. And we're not supposed to feel frustration or anger about that responsibility because in the magical world that we live in, it just makes us warm and fuzzy and happy to sacrifice everything for others. And I think there's right. a lot of that in teaching. Right. If you, if you don't enjoy giving of yourself, you know, selflessly of doing everything for the kids every minute and always setting your needs aside, then maybe you're not in the profession for the right reasons. Maybe you don't really care about kids. I think there's a lot of that kind of pressure going on. I think there is too. And it's, it goes even deeper to the issue of identity, which is, you're not a good person. You, you know, you're, you're, yes. you're, you're not a good person because you feel these negative emotions, which are frankly the most reasonable and rational response to the situation you might be finding yourself in, you know, under resourced, no time, no money, no support. That's often the situation that teachers find themselves in. And yet 
we just as a society expect them to give of their time and energy and their bodies and their minds. And it's a whole job, you know, it's, it it implicates every aspect of your existence. How do you think this is different for men who are in the profession? Because I've talked on the podcast before about how, you know, the expectations for teachers are based on expectations for women. It, as you said, it's, a, it's an ex, seen as an extension of mothering. And then when men enter the field, a lot of times they're held to those same expectations. That's right. But- so it's interesting because I think, you know, I think a lot of male teachers that I've talked to, they're still experiencing the slight stigma of entering a women's field. Mm-hmm. And they do actually, as teachers often have within the field of education, higher status and more pay. So they will tend more to go into administration or, for example, to teach in high school as opposed to in primary school, right, or elementary school. And so within teaching itself, there are all kinds of subtle hierarchies, right? Are, are more men teaching STEM classes, for example? And so those dynamics are reproduced even within the education system. And so, yes, I do think men feel this exact same exhaustion and stress and pressure, but I would also say that it's, it's sometimes different in nature because in, in its quality, because men still are not thought of as intrinsically inherently designed to do this work. So it's almost as though some people, including parents, feel that men have to overcome their maleness to be good teachers. I've talked to many adults who are kind of wary about men being yes. teachers. Yes, they're suspicious of them. Like, you know, and they're not not quite like, can I can I can I leave my kids alone with this with this man in a way that they wouldn't think about that with women. Right. I want to go back to something that you were saying in the beginning about um the different types of tasks that men and women are responsible for and how, you know, in the home, something that a woman does on a regular basis is something that she is expected to be naturally good at, such as, you know, managing the logistics of childcare, meal preparation, and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Whereas if a man is doing it, then he's seen as sort of, you know, helping. And the type of maintenance tasks that men are often responsible for at home are more of isolated chores, So it might be something like, you know, going to get the oil changed in the car or something like that versus the day in, day out, daily grind. And you talk about the constant decision making um, that that so many women are making minute by minute, especially caring for kids in the home um, and how that makes a woman's workload just so exhausting. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yes. I mean, I think that, you know, one of the major public social public policy issues we have is care work and who does it and who is recognized for doing it and paid for doing it. And even in the U S we know that girls and women are still doing much more of that work, whether it involves the children or the elderly or just domestic chores. Uh, I think the average is two hours more, including in children. So if kids have chores at home, girls are on average doing two hours more than boys. Boys are also more likely to be paid for their chores and to be paid more for their chores and to do chores that are marketable outside of the home. So think of the difference between unloading the dishwasher, which a girl might be more likely to do, and mowing someone's lawn, which a boy is more likely to do. The boy can mow the lawns of 10 people in his neighborhood. The girl is not going to empty the dishwashers of 10 households, right? <laughs> and so that, I mean, that, that literally is the way children learn sex segregation and labor. And they learn it really early on and they learn lessons about whose time is valued. And so even adults, we know in childcare, men and women do different types of work. And uh, the quality of that work can produce a lot of stress for women. So a man might, for example, give a child a bath and that bath will be fun. You know, you can have fun bathing a child, um, less fun bathing three children, admittedly, <laughs> but you can have fun bathing a child. If however, you are responsible for making sure that a child has all their medications and their EpiPen every day. And, um, you, you are responsible for the logistics of making sure that, the child can get home every day 
that's a different order of stress, right? That, that maintenance of every small detail that can be life or death sometimes, right? Because these, these are really often dangerous situations, even though we don't think of them as dangerous situations, because if we did, it would be overwhelming. So the quality of the care that men and women provide also really matters, not just the time spent doing it. Mm -hmm. So what you're advocating for really is sort of an an ungendering is one of the terms that you use in the book so that we're not thinking, you know, men are just, all men are just naturally strong and protective right. and all women are just naturally kind and caring, right. and, you know, enjoy giving of themselves. And, you know, their number one thing that fulfills them for all women is, is childcare, right. that sort of thing. So, um, so we're sort of ungendering these qualities and you're also talking about ungendering emotions because there are certain emotions that, um, are permissible for women to express and some that are permissible for men to express. Can you speak to that some? Uh, yes, we, we do have these feelings that women are infused with emotionality and that that's just has something maybe to do with our biology and um, men on the other hand, don't have feelings and, that's really debilitating to everyone. And we, mm -hmm. we know that you know, the lessons that children learn about gender are really powerful lessons about emotions, who gets to have them and who can express them. So boys, very, very early on, children learn that masculinity means being strong, means being stoic means not showing vulnerability or weakness, both of which are seen as feminized and feminizing. So little boys often are cut off from, from feelings of sadness or fear and empathy, whereas girls are supposed to embody those feelings and to ignore and reject and minimize the more powerful negative feelings they may have, such as anger or behaviors associated to anger, like aggression. And so what happens to boys often is they grow up being not, you know, they, they cannot, they feel that they cannot express their fears or their sadness in a way that other people will hear them or understand. And the most extreme outcomes of that are higher rates of suicide and violence against other people, because not being able to express your emotions is deeply unhealthy and boys learn to externalize that, that negative aspect of their lives with violence and girls on the other hand, subsume all their anger. Exactly. So, and a lot of times I think we're not even calling it anger. We're, we call it frustration or impatience or we're exasperated, we're irritated because even just owning that word anger is so difficult. I, I know I feel that way. Absolutely. I mean, adults will look at a baby, even in infancy, adults will look at a baby girl and a baby boy and the children will be behaving in the exact same way, but the adults will describe a baby girl as sad or um, um, in need of help in some way, and they will describe the baby boy as angry or tetchy or, you know, some more kind of aggressive f fighting metaphor language, even though the children are acting the same way. And they will, you know, adults will look at a, a girl who's angry and say, oh, she's sad. And they will look at a boy who's sad and say, oh, he must be so angry. They just, it's, it's a real, um, it's amazing. It's like wearing a pair of sex segregation goggles when, when we look at people. Mm. And that goes on through adulthood. We see it constantly. But anger and sadness are really different, right? I, I mean, anger implies this idea that you might be able to control something, that you want to make some change, that you have identified a problem, and that you are demanding that something happen, for better or worse. Whereas sadness is a retreat emotion. It's like a, a much more resigned emotion. And it has more empathy in it, but it also has a quality of powerlessness to it. Right. And so if you can't express your anger without being seen as irrational or emotional, um, or some other negative uh, quality to it, then 
um, and you talk about in the book about how that that anger is our first line of defense against injustice, being able to speak up when something's not right. Yes, that's right. I mean, anger is this vital emotion in human evolution. It is a signal emotion. It tells us when something's wrong. It tells us that we are suffering an indignity or a threat. And so my question really is, what are we doing when we separate access to that emotion from girls and women? What are we saying to them? Because what, what we actually do is we, we make indignity and unfairness and um, acceptance of slight and insult and threat imminent in our notions of femininity. Those become part and parcel of being good girls and good women. And on the other hand, for boys who are denuded of other emotions like sadness and even, you know, acting kind, their sense of themselves becomes dominated by this idea that anger and angry expression is what is how men are real, how men are real men. I love how in your book, you, you help us see anger as a useful emotion and not necessarily a negative one. Can you share some strategies for, for women to make their anger into something that's useful? Well, first of all, I think a lot of us, and this was certainly the case with me, we have, we struggle to even name our anger. As you said, sometimes it's hard to recognize the anger and it requires us to unlearn so many life lessons uh, so that we, we can even articulate the idea that we're angry. Once we do that, once you say, oh, actually, this feeling I have, I'm angry. It's not, it's, you know, a lot of us have problems even getting to that point. So once you say I'm angry, the second thing to do that is really vital is to understand the meaning of that anger. What is the anger telling you? Anger is full of information. Audre Lorde said that, you know, decades ago. What is the information in the anger and what are you going to do about it? And once you've identified the meaning of the anger, then step three, I would say, is now what is your plan? What are you going to do? Because you've identified a problem. You've identified that the problem is meaningful to you and that in order for you to eliminate the problem, something has to happen. Who has to help you do that? Is it your spouse? Is it your coworker? Is it your child? Is it someone you don't even know, right? And so the solutions range from being applicable in a personal setting, a professional setting, and a political setting. In all three, anger is relevant for bringing you to that knowledge and the sense that you have the right to be heard and have your problem um, solved by yourself and the people around you. I want to wrap up with um, a return to this thought about ungendering our emotions and making it possible mm -hmm. where, you know, in many ways it feels like women can express any emotion but anger and men can only express anger mm -hmm. and how limiting that is, you know, how, how that um, it really limits us from being able to express a full range of who we are and how we're feeling and how, you know, anger should be an emotion that is accessible and acceptable for women. Right. Um, and how men should also be able to access um, their other emotions without it, it being, you know, quote, unmasculine or, or weak or feminine, which are often seen as synonyms in some ways. Right. Um, and so I, I'm thinking about the people who are listening to this, who are working with children every single day, who may be parents themselves, who might be seeing these issues show up in their own marriage, as I've seen, um, what advice would you would you give them? What is something that you wish that every person listening understood about this process of ungendering our emotions? This is, I think, extremely um, simple, and I hope not simplistic, but men and women are far more alike than they are different. And yet in our society, all of the emphasis is put on the difference we're all human beings. We all have these emotions. Everybody feels anger. Everybody feels sadness. And it makes no sense to be gendering these feelings. As a matter of fact, not only does it not make sense, it is definitively harmful to people and to society. So what I'm saying is, if you find yourself thinking in terms of gender, if you find yourself teaching children politeness norms according to whether they are for example, boys or girls, 
challenge yourself to stop doing that because even the most basic childhood lessons about how to behave have such a long tail in society. There's no reason why all children can't learn to be kind and considerate to other people in exactly the same way. And that's what I think we need to, we need to understand. We need to get at, you know, we should resist the urge to tell boys that they have to be stoic and that, you know, they shouldn't cry or, or that um, to, to be considerate of others or empathetic is actually to be weak. They get a lot of those messages by default. So in addition to just not doing it, we also have to counter those messages, right? We have to make sure that girls understand that it's okay if they feel angry and we have to stop punishing them just for being assertive or for being aggressive, which are also different from anger. In girls, we don't distinguish among those three things very well. If a girl is just forthright and confident and shares her opinion, many people will say, wow, she's being really rude or really pushy. And so she goes from being sassy, you know, which is a sort of cutesy term for a young girl who shares her mind to being mm -hmm. a hormonal teen who is obnoxious, even though all she's trying to do is say, I believe in this. It's important to me. Listen to what I'm saying. I want to end with a final quote from Soraya's book, Rage Becomes Her. And this is the quote. Anger is the demand of accountability. Anger is the expression of hope. It is survival, liberation, creativity, urgency, and vibrancy. It is a statement of need, an insistence of acknowledgement. It is commitment, empathy, self-love, social responsibility. If it is a poison, it is also the antidote. Women especially will be told to set our anger aside in favor of a kinder, gentler approach to change. This is a false juxtaposition. Re-envisioned, anger can be the most feminine of virtues, compassionate, fierce, wise, and powerful. Your anger is a gift you give to yourself and the world that is yours. In anger, I have lived more fully, freely, intensely, sensitively, and politically. If there was ever a time not to silence yourself, to channel your anger into healthy places and choices, this is it. A big thanks to Soraya Chumley for these beautiful, wise, inspired words. Have a great week. You can do this. And remember, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be worth it.